and I'm inviting you that we're live streaming. We have a wonderful panel here of playwrights, facilitated and moderated. Let's see how much control we have this time. <laughs> by Annesley Jemison, Delaney Studi, and Vicki Ramirez, who are part of the Jiva family, I'm happy to say. And um, Delaney Studi is, we all enjoy, everybody who got the chance to see it, and so we walked last season, it was just amazing. And Delaney, yes. And Delaney is joining the Jiva as an artist in residence for 2024 to 2026, and we're so excited that she's coming to Delaney is also the artistic director of Native Voices, and we've been having conversations, I think, since last summer about ways in which we could collaborate, including this um, symposium. So thank you for that, Delaney. Thank you. And Vicki Ramirez, we are so excited you're joining us and your play, Pure Native, in April and May of next season. Oh, this, I guess it is next season technically, but it's 24, 25. And I think it even starts on April 15th. You'll look forward to your program and we have the exact dates. And we're so excited that you've joined us here too today. And I'm going to go sit down and listen to them. Okay, so um, this is an interesting one for me. Um, I was fortunate enough to catch Delaney's uh, performance last year in Silver Walk, and it was fantastic, absolutely amazing, and uh, really loved the telling of you and your father's journey and that experience, and that had to be very um, rewarding in a lot of ways, you know, just to be able to not only to have that experience with him, but then also for yourself to then bring that to life. And again, sharing it with a, a non-native audience who may have heard of the Cherokee Trail of Tears and things like that, but really not understanding really where we're at today and how that still impacts, you know, indigenous peoples. And, you know, I guess much like Santee's piece, you know, the mush hole, there's a psychology that kind of goes into this work. And you want to understand, like, how do you think about these details? When do you know this is right for there? And this is something that, like, okay, you're going to have this whole, you know, outline of, like, events and occurrences and things like that that happen. Sequentially, how do you get them all to kind of come to life? And how do you, as a one person show, and you're acting out different roles and characters and things like that along the way, what is the psychology behind, you know, that type of work? I mean, obviously it starts out as a, you know, pen and paper, you know, and it's a story. But you're also, you know, in a, in a way, a repository of maybe a lot of num a number of different stories that you're gathering and taking in, and now how do I bring these to life? So how, do, how does that happen? It was a very interesting process. Um, because it is a very personal story. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is the first draft of It's We Walk was six hours long. Yeah, yeah. and it read like a travelogue. <laughs> it was about a travelogue. In fact, my director, Corey Madden, is like, didn't you fight really hard to get your father to go on this walk with you? Because at first you didn't understand why he was important and essential to tell the story. My father, um, he was an old speaker, which means his first language was Cherokee, and he didn't learn English until he was sent to boarding school when he was nine. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he never talked about his boarding school experience until I was in my late 20s. And uh, I was actually showing one of my films at his old boarding school, uh, which was bought by the Cherokee Nation in 1984 and turned into a cultural school. So it, they were screening one of my films. And my dad was just going through and he's like, oh, this is the boys' dorm. That's the girls' dorm. That's where we had dinner. That's the chef where they beat us. Over there is the baseball field. But it was just like that, very matter of fact. And so, um, you know, so. So going in uh, to telling the story and also the importance of having my father go along is I knew that um, I had lost so much because I'm the first generation of my family not to go to boarding school that he purposely tried to protect me. 
Um, but I wanted him to be able to, to have these conversations. And so um, by the fourth or fifth or two hundredth draft of the show, my father and I actually made an appearance in my own show. <laughs> and, um, and about our relationship and what happened as we were going along, him as a boarding school survivor, and me as someone that I thought I was the stronger person because I didn't have to go through that. You know, um, and what was interesting is when I was telling the story, and after we had <coughs> people, I realized that along the Trail of Tears, I, I felt the impact of the loss, and my father came to life. And um, I think one of the most, like, oh, sorry, I just lost my father this year, so that's, oh, no, thank you. I, I took the year off from doing the show for that reason. But um, when we were, on the trail, he got to speak his language with an elder, and we did the whole interview between him and um, Dr. Amanda Swimmer, who has also since passed on, and they had the most amazing conversation all in the Cherokee language, and at that moment I realized that was the first time I was seeing my father as his authentic self, because every time he would speak to me, he had a code switch, because I don't speak Cherokee fluently, and so he always had to like step, step outside of his true nature and talk to me, you know, like I was the only ago white person. And um, so to be able to see him come to life in that moment was really important. And then like uh, Santi was sharing, it's like, it's, it's not my story, you know, it is my story about me and my father retracing the Trail of Tears, but it's also the story of our people. And about this one moment, you know, the Trail of Tears and how that is a defining moment of our lives, but it doesn't define us as who we are. And, um, and so it was very important to me, even though I'm Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma, uh, we start the story of Easter Band, you know, in North Carolina, where uh, the Cherokee, the res you know, the, the resurrection of the Cherokee Indian is right now, the Easter Band, um, because that's where we started. That's where my family came from. And so I, even though we're both Cherokee, you know, there's three different sovereign nations, um, those, they're, they're their own separate sovereign nation. The way they do things is different from me. So it was very important that we did all the research ahead of time that we spoke in front of tribal council, got permission, and we got permission from all the community houses to speak to the elders. Uh, even though they're my own people and even though they are my relatives, it was important to me that they knew I was coming in not to be extractive, but to find out ways that we could give back to the community and to keep the relationship going. And I have to say that I still have ongoing relationships with them, which is very exciting and wonderful. And so in a weird way, you know, the story, which I, I love calling it my love song to my papa, um, He still carries on who he is, and um, his resilience, his strength, and also um, his hope for a future generation. And one of the things my father told me was that um, during the Trail of Tears, right when uh, the fraudulent treaty was signed, um, uh, Chief John Ross came back and he told everyone to plant their corn that season to prove to Creator, the government, and each other that we had no intention of leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true, we didn't get to see, uh, thank you so much, uh, we didn't get to see, uh, we didn't get to harvest that year's crop because we were removed. But my father said, um, we plant those seeds, even though we may never get to see them sprout, because we know that a future generation will. And so that was the psychology of why I did the show and how it came to be. And it's also why my father is a main character in the show. I, I planted so many people of strength and courage because I don't have that. I have severe social anxiety, so I need to be able to turn into people that inspired me. You know, that's a great thing about a one-person show is you get to switch characters on a dime. And I purposely, on those moments where my character, like the, that's based on me, Delana, uh, was having the hardest times in, in my life in that moment, I would turn into my father or an elder because it, that's how I found my strength, is knowing that <coughs> those ancestors are always with us. And at the time, I knew what that meant, but now that my father has passed, I feel it on a, in my blood memory. I know it's in my body. And so, um, I purposely, if you look at the set for So We Walked, it's a seven-sided stage because it represents a council house. Uh, my grandmothers visit me all the time just because I wanted to make sure that I was safe <coughs> retelling the story. And it was very important to me that I didn't re-traumatize myself or any of the Native people that were watching the show. I wanted them to leave with, you know, with the feeling of hope for the future. And so I hope that came across. Did you guys get all that in the show? <laughs> 
that is the that is the that is the level of detail again that that's that genius that creative genius that really is shining through where it's just a set and it's a space and it's a you know and Sam T talks about it where like you transform into these beings these people they, and, and then you, you transform the space as well and um, you know and Sam and I were kind of joking about it when we talked is that you know we don't want to sound hokey but it's almost like a ceremonial space in a way Absolutely. that you're leaving, you know, some very raw emotions, and you also have a responsibility to these stories, to this, to this history, to this culture, this transfer of knowledge and sharing and things like that. That you have to be respectful of it while you're in that space, and that you also have to leave it there because you can't carry it because that's how you maintain and can carry on as building this duty. Yes. You know, so it's. You know, she says cathartic in this way that it's that healing and that process and things. But again, you know, your, your father was one of those people who was also that culture bearer, you know, who was able to retain the language and do those things um, despite of what the, the boarding school had done to him, you know. And um, it's amazing the, the level of resilience that, you know, are in these old people, you know, and in these, in these people. And again, that same concept that you just talked about in terms of like, you know, we plant the seeds knowing that a future generation is going to be able to experience and appreciate these things. Even though I may not ever taste that or eat that or, you know, I've heard the same metaphor about trees. You know, people will go and plant trees and never really see the shade of that tree, you know. It's really profound, you know, and really inspiring to hear, again, that concept of seven generations ahead. And you know, thinking about not just the self, but like that, the, the carrying on, you know. So I'm going to move over to our, our next our next friend here, <laughs> um, and, and, and but we're going to come back, I promise. So you know, I did a little bit of the reading about you know the treatment of um, pure native that's coming up, and the idea in the story is around a, a, an individual who comes back to community after having some substance abuse issues and challenges and things like that. And then has this idea of like, well, I'm gonna become an entrepreneur in the community. And, you know, I got a great idea. We're gonna sell bottled water, you know? Something innocuous is bottled water, you know? And something that, again, if you've followed anything about Native culture in the last decade or so, we're water protectors, you know? We have what happened at Standing Rock and things like that. And so water is sacred. Water is something that is essential to all of our ways of life and things like that and for it to be commodified becomes this issue right and there lies the rub and there lies the challenge so um, by selling water this, this character's partner has an issue with you can't sell what's not yours to sell you can't sell our culture you can't sell that which is here to sustain us where does that teaching come from uh, <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I have to admit I had a bit of an epiphany this afternoon when Doug George was speaking, when he was speaking about the uh, cycles of generational trauma and abuse, of how it impacted uh, how they were talking about. Because I'm from the Six Nations, and I did laugh in that evil cackle when they talked about the... Uh, the fights at, uh, for, <laughs> during the cross because that is my people, that is my family. That is, you know, that is my family. They're, you know, we're sarcastic before we're, we're sincere. Um, and it's, it's it, and I realized that's, oh, that's grandpa. And grandpa shared the wealth and uh, probably great grandpa as well, though. I, I didn't get to actually speak with the gentleman, but I would just, like, uh-huh, that's where that comes from. And so with Cure Native, the whole story about Brewster is that Brewster is somebody who is traditional and his partner is not, but she always wanted, it's that, oh, I want to be that. And it's like, well, you're born who you are for your reason, you're a Christian Indian. He's longhouse traditional, born, but he is always torn. He always, um, so he's kind of bad mind, I don't want to say specifically, but he's in that area, you know, he's in that just area, so he leaves, goes to the city, finds a way to survive and succeed in the city, and he comes back to the reservation, and he's like, I'm going to share what my knowledge with you, what I've learned outside, and this is water, we got lots of it, and, 
you know, yeah, it's not traditional to sell, to commodify that which sustains us, but hey, uh, you know, things change, traditions change, like the river changes, and, you know, it's got this great pattern. <laughs> and it's, it's about that, that sort of seduction of, and, and the thing we're all dealing with day in, day out of living within two worlds, where, you know, as indigenous people, and the push and pull of trying to survive, and, you know, what do you sacrifice to survive? You know, it, it becomes bearing a lot of gifts, a lot of ideas, a lot of, you know, they're going to give small business loans, we're going to help shore up the infrastructure of the river, or make sure we'll treat it right, and it's like, but can we fish? Oh. We can't, we can't, well, we'll let you do controlled fishing, but maybe in this, it, it starts to have that conversation. Um, and yeah, so that came from just, most of my stories, people start talking in my head before it, <laughs> before it becomes an uh, actual conscious thought. But it, uh, it is about that question of how much do we sacrifice to get along and survive day to day, you know, and that push and pull. So this leads me to this question then. Both indigenous women, both playwrights, both culturally informed as well, and we struggle as indigenous people, and I, and I say me myself included in this, and you know, and I'm an amateur, <laughs> amateur podcaster, but knowing how much we can share, knowing that line as to what we can share, where we're not commodifying our culture, in a way, and being extractive, as you mentioned, you know. Um, how do we know that line, and what is that line? Because also, we also realize that, like, what we know is, again, I think, in the blood of this land, of this place. And in order for our guests to understand how to conduct themselves here, they should know these stories. They should understand what it means to be a part of this, to see these things as relatives, the water, the, the trees, all these things. They're not resources. The yeah. relatives, you mm -hmm. know. How do we find that line, and what is that line, Delena? Oh goodness. Um, well, one of the things I do in, in, in So We Walked is I actually have a stomp dance. Um, and if if you are not native, I give you enough clues about what the ceremony is without uh, being instructional on how to do the ceremony. <laughs> Um, but if you are native, and especially if you are, um, you know, a, a southeastern tribe that stomps, uh, you're familiar with what I'm talking about. When I say, uh, you know, the women in their turtle shells, you know exactly what I mean. But if you are not from that culture, you, you imagine something probably entirely different. Or if you're talking about people dance with cans in their legs, yes. Yes. the turtle shells. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I don't even say that it's on their legs. I just, say, <laughs> yeah, I just like turtle shells rather. You know, it's yeah. like I, I hint, but I don't instruct. And um, and I do use a social song in the back that uh, in the background as the music that I actually got permission to use. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, so I don't do anything um, that I'm not supposed to share, uh, and I don't do anything that hasn't been shared before, mm -hmm. right? And um, and so for me, it's having those conversations, uh, especially when I was you know my father, God bless him, he was um, he gave me permission to share stories and. There's a, in, in the play, there's a moment where uh, we have this huge fight, this really awful fight, and it's, you know, because no one can push your buttons like your family, right? They know, they know exactly how they wound you, and when they wound you, they go for blood, you know, because that's how families do. And, and so I had toned down the fight, and my father was like, what's this? And I was like, well, it's our fight. And he's like, that's not our fight. And I was like, well, I'm going to be doing this in front of a bunch of people we don't know. And he's like, so you're going to lie? And I was like, well, we're not the Kardashians. <laughs> and he's like, if you're going to tell the truth, then you tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, the truth is, we were mean to each other. We didn't speak for months after that fight. Mm -hmm. And people need to know that that fight hit hard, and that it drew blood, and that we were still able to come together after the fight. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's so funny, my father made me tell the truth about that fight. And it's a very vulnerable fight. You know, it's... It was one of those moments where, um, sorry, I don't mean to be a big bucket of tears up here, um, but it was one of those moments where I had gone home and um, and I talk about my dad, you know, my dad, I talk about how I don't feel like I'm enough. And every time I come home, I'm reminded that I'm not enough. And then he says, um, 
you know, he talks about why I should be there, why my ancestors, you know, lived and died so that I could have a small portion of land that we live on. And I remember just yelling at him, like, there's, I can't live in Oklahoma, Dad. There's nothing for me here. And his response is, we're here. You got us. But we are not enough. And ooh, God, that hurt me. It hurt so hard. But it was the truth. It was like, yeah, I was worried about not feeling enough at any time. I was making them feel like they weren't enough. And if there's anything, it's my family was more than enough. I was very lucky. But, uh, but, you know, you have to have those moments of truth in order to get to the other side. And sometimes the truth is painful. Sometimes it's something you don't want to confront, let alone share in front of hundreds of strangers. <laughs> but, um, but that's the only way we can get, you know, through is by going through it. And so, uh, you know, that was one thing about my pops was like, he's like, if you're going to just sugarcoat it, then you're doing the same thing that, you know, the white government did to us. You're erasing who we are. And you're trying to make this fit this stereotype of us being like this noble savage. And the truth is, we are flawed, beautiful people. Yeah. So show all of our beautiful flaws. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, <laughs> microphone. <laughs> for me, I, uh, I I don't really have a conscious um, line in my head, but the way I write is my audience is is Haudenosaunee like people. It's my family, it's Haudenosaunee people. So I try to write as if they're sitting in the room and that's who I'm co corresponding with. And you wouldn't educate Haudenosaunee people on their own stories. You wouldn't go into depth about that with people in the room who already know the story. You might, you would talk about, like you might make a reference in your native, I, I reference Thunderbolt, <laughs> you know, but I don't, give the story so much as I make a reference. And it's like, I hope folks come along. I hope enough of the story is around there that the rest of the audience can figure it out. But I'm not going to fill in details that I, I, it's just like, because that's always been my thing is uh, I, I write for Indian people. And I want everyone to see us in all our complexity in our humor, in our pain, the trauma is there, but also there's a lot of humor too. A lot of dark humor, but a lot of humor, a lot of fun. And I, and that's always my focus, is to just stay with the people in the room. And it's mm -hmm. usually in my head, my grandpa's sitting there judging me. <laughs> <laughs> he also had a very dark sense of humor. Well, I think you're both saying um, that you're, you're doing it through an indigenous lens you know, in an indigenous voice. And that's the truth. That's what has to come forward, and that's what has to be real. And I think that, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, there is no really defined line, because there, everything has already been written about us. You know, I mean, we're probably some of the most studied people on the planet, you know, in a lot of ways, and written about and everything else. But there are things that we do have to guard. There are things that we do have to protect and keep sacred and, and do those sort of things. And people may not always understand why that is, you know what I mean? And, but it's, again, I think it's a different sort of understanding of our relatives and the things around us that we hold sacred, that we hold personal, that we want to protect and, and preserve because we've seen the extractive side. We've seen when things have been taken away, when either beaten by force or whatever that is, now that we have it back and now we have the agency to kind of protect those things. We know when it's appropriate to do those types of things, I guess. But I think it's still important that the two of you in the space you, you travel in, you are now responsible to these stories, responsible to educating other people, you know. And again, yes, you know, when I, when I first read your stuff last night, you know, I, you know uh, Rachel was able to kind of preface a little bit of stuff. I mean, send me a bunch of things to kind of, here, take a look at this, you know, and I, and I got into it. And I started reading your stuff, and I was like, shit, she talks like I do. <laughs> you know, sorry, I'm swearing. <laughs> but, you know, but that's the honesty, and that's the truth, and that's what, like, really kind of drew me to, like, your, your writing was that, like, I see myself in that writing. I, see, I hear myself in that writing, you know, and that's what was really kind of cool for me, you know. Now, for your stories, you know, not being as educated and not knowing as much about, you know, the Cherokee, you know, culture and things like that, hearing it first person and hearing and seeing you share that, that gave me that sort of insight, you know, look. 
And that was valuable, you know, again, because again, I think it's for us as, as indigenous people, you know, we talk about the oral tradition as like a big pillar into like how we learn things and how we get how we gather information and understood things about each other. Um, but your work is both oral and then also even physical, you know. And that's how as people, as young people, as children, how we acquire language, how we acquire storytelling, how we acquire ways of conduct and doing those types of things. And I'm, why, where I'm getting to with all of this is that we're now in this world where a device, a screen, is informing our people, informing our children, doing these different things. And that if we all kind of take this look back and to understand that like, having meaningful interactions with people is really where you're going to do some real understanding and learning. And so these people here are being privy to an experience that people who have a screen in their face right now are not experiencing. They're not having this opportunity to hear it from an indigenous woman, from an indigenous storyteller, from an artist, you know. And that to me is what's absolutely beautiful about what the work that you both do. But how do you translate the work that you're doing to young people, to young native playwrights that we're looking to try to grow and develop? How do we build that next generation? And what are the things that you guys have pushed to make that happen? I believe that leads us into our next panel, which will be later. But, um, <laughs> I don't want to steal it. Yeah. I yeah. Uh, so, uh, so for you know, one of the things, and I'll talk about this more whenever I get Jasper up here. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Jasper. Uh, but we have one of your young native playwrights in the audience today. You'll get to meet him later on, and you also will get to see um, see his play that he's so crafted. It's beautiful, and so we're going to be able to share that with you, with, along with another native playwright, a young native playwright. But um, for me, it was always, when I think of storytelling, I think of the first time that I heard a story. And it was always either perched at my daddy's lap or my grandma's lap when they were telling a story. Uh, sometimes it would be a traditional story, sometimes it would not. Sometimes they'd get really creative and all of a sudden, like, you know, the Scooby Gang and Wonder Woman appear in the traditional story. <laughs> uh, you know, but it find a way to work me in. And, um, and I remember just like, you know, hearing all those beautiful stories as a small child and then going to school, and you know, I went to a small school in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. It was so traumatic, I don't mention the town's name. <laughs> yeah, side eye to the town. Anyway, um, and so, but no one ever came to my school to tell me that my, that my voice mattered or that my culture was valid. No one taught me that I could have a creative career where I get to do storytelling, where I get to, in a weird way, help preserve our history, our language, and our culture by storytelling. That was not something you did. You did not encourage your kids to go to school to be actors or playwrights. You encouraged them to do something practical, like go to school for engineering, which is what I did. Uh, you know, and so I think about that, and every work, all the work I do, is centered around uh, that selfish gift to my 12-year-old self, right? Because I don't want another Native child to, to not feel like their voice isn't heard or matters. Um, and you know, I, I strongly believe in intergenerational learning because that's how I grew up. You know, my grandma and my grandpas were an active part of my life. And, you know, and I learned as much from them as they learned from me. You know, and in fact, to my grandma, Weaver died, she lived to be 100. She was learning how to use, like, technology. And this is a woman that was born in 1912, so before technology even existed. <laughs> it was like, I don't even think they had TVs back then. You know, it was like, she was alive when the Titanic sunk. You know, so it was like, <laughs> that's how old my grandma was. And so, uh, you know, so it was always that give and take of information. And I feel like whenever we, you know, that's one of the things that's very important to what we do at Native Voices is how do we create that intergenerational learning? How do we, um, how do we acknowledge that I might be older than you and I have something to teach, but also you might be younger than me, but you also have something to teach. How do we encourage that? And as far as theater goes, you know, I, selfishly once again, it's, you know, I feel like we have to, we have to reach out to the youth because the youth are going to be the ones that are going to carry our stories into the future. Um, you know, one of the things I learned when I was researching the Trail of Tears is that for a lot of our Native stories, especially the story about, um, you know, the Cherokee trickster g Stew, which was Rabbit, uh, they, they stopped evolving about the same time as residential schools and assimilation. You know, you, you would hear about g Stew, the Rabbit, having a bow and arrow or a spear or an Ottawa, and then, uh, then they got a musket and then they got the repeating rifle, but you don't hear g Stew with an iPhone. <laughs> right? Which is a good weapon. I mean, it's really like the most powerful <laughs> weapon right now. Um, but you 
know, it, they stopped evolving at a certain time, and it, it, it just dawned on me that in order for a culture to really survive and thrive, then the stories must evolve with that culture. And so, you know, by you know by um, convincing people like Jasper to take a playwriting class, um, you know, it's it's just, hopefully it will spark uh, more stories. Because if there's anything I can say about all the students that took this young native playwrights course, is I learned so much. And I was inspired by all the plays that if these were made into full production, I would be the first person to sign up to either A, produce it, or be in the front row. <laughs> it's like, it's, that's how amazing it is. But we have to, you know, I don't know, for me it's just like the give and take of information and also how do we spark the imagination of the next generation and let them know uh, you may not be a, a billionaire, or as I like to call them, wealth hoarders, um, but uh, you can make a living doing this work, right? You can. And it, and also, you know, it's how do you define success? For me, it's like success is knowing that there are people like Jasper out there telling me stories. You know, it's, success is knowing that there are people like you and Vicki and that these stories are going to keep going and, and lead out in the audience. You know, it's, it's, that's success. It's like there are, even if my voice is silenced by some unknown force, there are millions of others that are out there that are telling me stories and actually probably doing a far better job than I am. And that gives me hope, and that's why I think it's important that we, you know, we, we get the kids, because that's, they're our future, as you know. Sorry, Vicki, your turn. Oh. <laughs> I, um, well, I, uh, I teach often, um, and uh, I was teaching, Alter Theater did a uh, remote learning playwriting course over the pandemic. Um, and it was astonishing to me that a lot of these kids just were afraid to trust their own voices. So my teaching now has kind of really evolved into teaching them to trust. It's like, give me a name. Like, I, I'll play sort of almost theater sports games with them. It's like, give me a name. And then uh, I'm like, you can throw it away later. Just give me one. And we start with that, and it's like, you want to write about basketball? Aces, we're writing about basketball. You want to write about the traditional teaching? Great, we're writing about that. You want to write about a sci-fi disco rabbit? Cool, <laughs> aces, give me three pages. And I, I try to teach them organically in like, look at your space, look at, because this is playwriting, this is people, this isn't pages in a book where you have to sit and think. Think about your space. Think about the space you're in, and and how it changes. And we we started throwing out things and, and talking. And I remember we got one conversation about cheese, mud cheese, that spanned uh, I would say about ten brilliant short plays that I wish we could somehow get from Alter Theater because they found a sense of community in that commonality, all telling their own story about commodity cheese and it was, it was it was really brilliant and fun but yeah that's just the one thing i want to get up there if you want to tell stories if you feel the urge to tell stories tell them there's no hoops to jump through i didn't go to college you don't need to go to college if you want to go to college that's brilliant and we celebrate that go by all means but trust your voice and get it out there the most important thing to do is to write the most important thing to do is to start the story and finish it. Everything else is cherries. Everything else is fabulous. Okay. <laughs> so where Delana was going early on was, you know, where stories came from was her sitting at her, her father's feet, right? Stories come from different places, you know, I mean, it could be around a campfire it could be around, you know, a six pack. <laughs> it could come from a lot of different places and things. But when you're telling the stories, and again, I guess you don't want to pigeonhole yourself, and that it's just you can only write about native stuff, right? Because you're, you're, we're, we're people of the world, and we do travel in two worlds, but we view it differently oftentimes because of the circumstance by which we grew up. How do we tell indigenous stories and contemporize them? I guess to now to a place where it's like, yeah, these stories do need to evolve because then they become bucolic, you know, and they kind of get fixed in these places. And we don't want to be fixed in one place because those, some of those places could be places of trauma, places of historical <laughs> violence and things like that. How do we bring these uplifting stories to evolve 
Is it adding elements like an iPhone? Is it adding, you know, contemporary situations to kind of, you know, that would add to this? And, and I guess where, I, where I'm going with this was that, you know, I, I was able to watch a, a, a reading of a story that you had come up with, um, the standoff on Highway 37. Talk a little bit about that and how that came about. Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, that play um, started because a certain mayor in New York City told the, the governor of New York to go up to Seneca with a shotgun and say, this is the law of the land, and it, we're representing the law, and a cowboy hat, I think the quote was. Mm -hmm. And I started, and I, just, I just lost my mind because I had flashback to Oka, and, um, and I started writing, and as I started, I, I wrote a short play from it, and then I found out almost like three weeks later, Six Nations in Caledonia had their first big land back fight where people were knocking down barricades and, and, and you know, they were sending the OPP out. And then I found about, out about the history predating that with Pataki sending the National Guard. Exactly. And I was just, what? And, and so that story had come to me sort of just as a f anger response to a Bloomberg statement. But I had also thought about, here's the thing <laughs> to tell you, talk about striding to room. My uncle was, uh, my uncle Rich um, is the highest honored military leader, a non-commissioned military officer in Canada for many years. Um, he, he, he advanced through the ranks of the non-commissioned officers. He led the guys at Oka. Tuscarora led the guys at Oka. And I just sort of, so my brain went, how do you reconcile that and be there and see your own people on the other side of the barrier? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, so I just kind of went down that rabbit hole. That's how that story came out because I wanted to understand. It's like, it's not, because for Uncle Rich, um, being a warrior is this great honor. It's, it's traditional. It's something we do to protect the people and everything. At the same time, you're like a police officer as well. You're somebody who is trying to control the conduct of the people, especially your own people. Um, so that, for me, that came out of like current circumstances and I wrote in that moment from, but again, it's when I started hearing the voices in my head and sometimes I feel like that's some people nudging me to put those stories down because it needs to be said. And um, yeah, so that's, that's where that came from, but I feel like regarding contemporizing, we have to look at the impact, the trauma, everything, the impact, how it rolls out, but we, again, let's, I, I, I also want to look at how do we live with it? How do we work with it? How do we function with it? How do we, in a way, Brewster, the character in Cure Nata, the one who's compromised, is trying his best to deal with what he's done in his life and how, it, how he's come to where he's come to. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, so those are the questions I always weigh in, in how to write contemporaneously and hopefully entertainingly, but just the questions of how do we function with that as our as that piano on our back with you know and with pride too because in the end like standoff which Delena was brilliant in by the way hilarious and brilliant and funny just standing up bullhorn energy it's just she was fantastic um, but um, that there was pride in, in the, his tra initially a trauma reaction, but then his taking a stance and saying, no, it, it, it's this really great sort of catharsis, I hope, for, <laughs> I'm projecting a great catharsis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the same thing for Brewster um, I, that the character goes through. And I think that's a way we can approach it from the contemporary. I think I went on. Yes, no, no, it's okay because 
I think with what you're doing is that you're, t you're also teaching history in a way, and you're teaching you know, some historical events, you're contemporizing them, but then you're also talking about people throughout history who have been flawed and have had to make very difficult decisions. I mean, <coughs> Joseph Grant comes to mind in terms of you know, having been raised British you know, and around Sir William Johnson and things like that, but then also moving his people to Canada to get the Haldeman track and all of those things. There's a lot of people who are kind of like, you know, he's an SLB, you know, he sold out his people and he did all these horrible things and whatever else, and there's really a lot of bad feelings about him. But nobody can really know what sort of decisions you have to make in that moment. When you're, when you're back against the wall, gun against your head, whatever that is. And you're going to be judged, history's going to judge you, right? I mean, the, 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 the people who follow that. But you're doing the best you can in that moment. And so, the stories that you're telling and those challenges that people had to face, indigenous people had to face with like, where you're standing up against your own people, you're straddling that line of like, you know, how, when, you know, can I, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen first, or I'm a community member first, but yet I'm charged with like upholding this, right? And then you also bring up the, I don't want to call it a trope, but it's like that warrior sort of thing that is very much ingrained in the culture as well, that like we still have, like, I mean, like, you know, the, the per capita numbers of indigenous people that enroll in, you know, are part of the military is, you know, per capita, it's, it's off the charts, right? And, and that's part of that warrior culture, but it's also like there's, we're defending our land, we're defending our home as well, we think in that, in that lens, right? Not just that we're standing up for like the, the US Constitution and everything else, but you have had opportunities, I guess, in, in both the work that you're doing is to like, bring historical stories into the contemporary times and you figure out how to finesse them in a way that it then becomes, oh, that's a teachable moment, but then also, oh, I'm gonna present this to you, now you go and research it and go find out more about it and you'll find out where this comes from, where that, where that, where the origin story of this all happens, right? And that's, I think, where, you know, and so the walk comes from, you know, is that, we hear the story in the paragraph that we get, you know, in, in our history books about the Cherokee Trail of Tears, but you contemporize it by like actually physically going back and walking this thing, you know. But along the way, history probably came to life, you know, through your father, through yourself, through the land. Absolutely. All those yeah. One of the it's so interesting because I, like I said, I went to school to be an engineer, so I'm very <laughs> here and not here. And I like being here. Here's safe, right? <laughs> Here's scary. <laughs> so I don't like going here. Um, but, you know, uh, so I was going to be the best doggone Cherokee woman I could be. And so I, I was doing mountains of research. I had the maps. I had all the journals. I had everything that was ever written about the Trail of Tears. And my dad's like, if you want me to go on this journey with you, then stop doing your research. And I was like, no, I can't do that. That's 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 the whole reason why I got the funding is I get to I got a butcher scholar award, so I kind of have to be the scholar, you know, that they're gonna show up and do the research. And he's like, no, I want you to stop it. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I want us to visit these places, um, and I only want you to have one book with you. And I was like, okay. And he's like, and that book is your dream journal. And I because my dad always, you know, we'd wake up in the morning, he wouldn't say, how did you sleep? He'd say, how did you dream? Because dreams are very important to my family and to my culture. And so uh, he's like, so you can have your dream journal. He's like, but I want you to go to these places and just experience them and see what comes up in your body. You know, what the ancestors are trying to tell you. And you, right now you're protecting yourself by hiding behind all these books. So I want you to stop it. And he was like, after we visit the place and you've had 24 hours after being in that place, then yes, you can read your book. And that, but that was the rules, and I was like, well, and it was very important my dad went with us, and so that's what I had to do. I had to like be present. Be present. And I, honestly, you know, as a you know, as me, Delana Studi, that's always the most vulnerable time. And I also feel like we're taught to not be present, especially in uh, in our schools, right? We're taught to be ready to pounce with that next question. You know, we were talking about this over our lunch. Is people listen to uh, respond and not listen to understand? And so allowing yourself that moment of quiet contemplation where you let someone's words actually affect you and you take them in and you wait a moment before you respond. 
it actually gives you, you know, so so much insight into who you really are, and um, and you know, as a person that was, you know, I, my mom's family is white, and I always grew up being called the half breed or the little squaw or the Cherokee princess, you know, and they they did it not out of harm, even though it was harmful. They did it as a, you know, as a my mother said it was a term of affection. I think it was also a reminder that I wasn't white, right? I, I think it was a, a clearly a, a little like, you're not like us, you're kind of like us. Um, but having that always like shown on me and you know thrust upon me, I had a hard time finding my voice. You know, so I'm grateful that Vicki is doing the work that she's doing because honestly it's, and I, and I say this all the time, it's like as a, as a, as a child in Oklahoma who was constantly reminded that I was not enough by my white family, um, I lost my voice early on, and so I was able to find my voice by using words from Vicky and from other playwrights, you know, and, and uh, finding my voice in those characters that were written where I wanted to be that strong Native woman. And how do I, how do I become that person? Uh, because I'm not seeing it on television, you know, I'm not seeing it, you know, now I am thinking of this work, you know, shows like Reservation Dogs and Brotherhood Falls. Um, but when I was younger, I, I didn't see it. I didn't see any women on TV. I think the first Native woman I saw on television uh, when, was uh, when Thunderheart came out with Sheila Towsey. That was the first Native woman I saw, where, which was a contemporary person. And, you know, and I don't think that's, you know, I, I, I believe that's on purpose because, you know, most non-Native people, especially, you know, uh, the, the white folks of this country, they like to keep us locked in the past because it makes it safer for them too, because they don't have to think about what they have done to us and how we are existing today. So I, don't, I feel like I just went off on a really no, no, large no. tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Vicki, I mean, you also in your writing call yourself a breed yeah. person. Yeah. You know? That's me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. So, Vicki, in your writing, also calls herself a breed person. And let me just lay into the breed part about it, okay, just a little bit. So, you're talking about a Tuscarora Six Nations woman that's half Jamaican. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, I'm wondering about music and dance and, all, all and the food. <laughs> always say it was funny when my dad first came to the res it was it was in the late 50s and you know he was off the airplane because he'd been in world war ii and he'd been traveling around and ended up in canada and uh, first in new york oh he was in new york yeah he was in new york for a year and he's like no man a two races down there but yeah move on <laughs> so he moved to canada which was a step better, maybe? <laughs> but uh, he, he, you know, he found it, 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 it was part of his journey, so he came to the reservation and he met my mom, <coughs> fell in love, this very quiet, but again, my mom was one of those firebrand Onishani women, just a Tuscarora girl, didn't get to go to high school, so she left, worked in Buffalo for a few years till she had enough money to go to nursing school. She had my brother along the way, and um, she took him with her to the Maritons, put herself through, became a nurse, and uh, was independent, sort of, in as much as she could be in those days when you still had to get your dad to sign off on a bank account. But, um, <laughs> you know, she, 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 she was very, very Haudenosaunee in that respect, and she met my dad, and they fell in love, and she brought my dad to the res, and he said, how, to my grandfather, and I don't know how, my mother couldn't have, couldn't have figured out to stop him from talking to her. <laughs> You know, so there was a lot of um, moment. You know, there's my grandfather in his well-pressed suit with his, 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 you know, his straw hat, and his carved cane, sitting there. This man's how I want to marry your. I want to make your daughter my squaw. Like every, 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 every misstep he could possibly make, he made. And, and you know, every time afterwards, you know, my grandfather, again, had 
has a very dark, had a very dark sense of humor, made him go outside and do a rain dance these days. <laughs> humor from, it's, it's, it's natural, but you know, my dad, after a while, he'd start bringing a little bit, you know, he'd bring like a bit of curry chicken, a bit of, you know, jerk seasoning, it's sort of my grandfather would be. <laughs> <laughs> It took time, it took time, and the music, but I mean, my cousins, they, they all loved the music, they would come and dance, though they would say, well, your dad's so, such a white guy, and I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> 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 he, he was very not, not initially, he was put it that way, but he, before he passed, he, and my mother pre-passed before him, she passed a good decade before him, but, you know, my sister lives on, just off fourth line, and she would bring my dad there for breakfast several times a week, and he'd do all his banking and his medical treatments on the rest. They all knew him. They were after him, you know, Mr. Ramirez, you know, and they'd walk him to the car and things. So it happened that he got adopted in in his own way, but, uh, yeah. So for me, though, what I, what I find striking and interesting is that, you know, you both identify and have these mixed backgrounds and things, but yet you lean into your indigenous side. And that's the side that you really kind of gravitate towards when, you know, in a lot of ways, it, it, you know, it's not cool to be Indian because it's hard. It was never cool to be Indian. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you make being Indian cool again? <laughs> Vicky's doing it. <laughs> I mean, I honestly, growing up, I, 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 you would, we, again, we went to school in Caledonia, and uh, for a while then, they didn't know what we were. Um, so they would talk freely around us, and we'd come back and tell our cousins all of these stories. All these people said this about us, you know. Uh, but. I, I didn't know, I, like, I, it wasn't a question. I was in the, I grew up right, like, not in the res, but we were there, like, three, four times a week at Grandpa's house. And uh, it, it, there, were, there wasn't a question. I mean, I always felt bad for my dad because my, when my mom and he moved off the res, it, you know, the rest of my dad's neighborhood in Kingston moved to Toronto and almost duplicated the neighborhood that they had in Kingston by the house, who moved in what house next to each other. So they reset up their neighborhood. Um, we visited maybe three, four times a year. He, my mom was like, you, you live here, we live here to the res, next to the res. And my dad was like, well, okay, I guess so. <laughs> you know? Can you, for the people who don't, can you, for the people who don't understand why you didn't love on the res? Can you explain that uh, situation? Sure. Yeah, this was during the time period. Um, Mom had permission for them to stay for a couple years, but after that, Dad was Jamaican, um, so they had to move off, and that was when the Canadian government had a lot of hands in what was going on on the res, and you know, losing your status when you marry non-indigenous. So, like, we were all, got our status back in the 80s with the, the LC, whatever. Um, I can't even remember what it's called now, that's how old I am. But, um, yeah, it, but she lost her status that way when she married that. But she got a two-year grace period. So, an indigenous woman would marry a man, and if he was non-native, she was then lost her status as a native person. The government determined you're no longer a native person. You need, you know, so now you got to get permission from your community as to whether or not it's okay if you stay on the reservation. And the reservation then decides, all right, you got two years, and then off you go. You were raised and grew up there your whole life, and this is it. So they move into the Caledonia, the next town over, closest to the res, where now you're experiencing border town violence and racism and all the horrible things. And now you're plopping down children to now, you know, integrate into that school system and now become a part of that and now integrate into that, that culture, essentially. That's a struggle that was happening 
just within you know the last 40, 50 years ish, you know. So this is still very much present. Yeah, yeah. question. So if mom loses her status, do you lose your status? I lost my status, yeah. I didn't get it back until the the I guess it's the TNC commission that did that, but the uh, uh, the the um, I got my status back when my mother got her status back, when the government realized, oh, we made a mistake, this is not their beliefs, so we have to fix that. That's when we all got our status back, and that's immediately my sister moved on the res, you know. So the movie that just came out, Killers of the Flower Moon, right, that three hour, oof. ouch. <laughs> Similar things were happening where white men were coming in and marrying indigenous women to gain control of their well hats for the right to that, that, that oil, that money. So this is something that you're now seeing systematically why people are being told don't trust white people. <laughs> Stay away from the white people, you know, is because these are the things that were happening that like they were people that were coming in deliberately you know, oftentimes, or even just through, you know, the sake of just falling in love with somebody, but because of, you know, government policies and things like that that were in place, you're then at risk of losing a status or whatever that is. Well, actually, my nephew um, went through something pretty traumatic. I won't share too many details, because it's really not my story to tell, but he had a relationship with someone who had a child, and the moment the child was born, cut off all access and wouldn't allow him near at all. Basically, but that person who was not indigenous now lives on the reservation through their daughter's claim. Wow. Yeah. I'll share a story that I know of um, a, a friend of mine who, this is how governments interfere with these things. And, and for those of you who may not be educated on this, native people are the only ones that have to carry a card, much like a horse, in order to, or, or a pedigree dog, in order to prove like how Indian you are, or how much, you know, when somebody looks at you and says, oh, you're Indian, and they kind of give you that once over look like, how much Indian are you, you know? We have to carry a card in order to kind of say that, like, here I am, you know? And then there then lies an issue and a conflict between like how, citizenship is determined through clanhood or clanship and things like that or whatever that is but then a government imposes a patriarchal system that then says that you are now the clan of whatever your father was and you are also of the nation of whatever your father is and that's how you're going to be determined whether or not you're a citizen or a native even though you may have grown up and we're a matrilineal line a matrilineal society this whole thing has now changed that so i have a friend who grew up here on the state side, where we are on the mother side, moves to Canada, where his wife is a you know full Cayuga Nation member there, and grew up in Six Nations and lived there, but because of the way that the system is set up, their children are non-status Indians in Canada, where both sides are you know in in indigenous, full, you know. And it's amazing that these are people, that there are people that live on the reservation today that are native. You look at them, that's a native person. But because of the way these government enrollments and systems work, this is still part of that colonization process. This is still the blood quantum stuff that is out there. All those sort of things muddies the waters. And then you have systems that are imposed on the reservations, a place like Akwazasli where you have a Canadian band council, an American, you know, elective system, and then you have a chief system. So you have three systems of governance that are located within the state of New York, the, the province of uh, um, uh, uh, Ontario, and then the, the province of Quebec. So now you have all these issues that happen there. And so we bring it to a story right where Delana lives, or is from Oklahoma, where people strongly hold on to the Dawes Act. Oh, yeah because of the status that it provides. And you have things and divisions that happen amongst different nations. Like you mentioned the Eastern Band, and then you have the Cherokee Band, that's the Oklahoma Band, where it's like federal recognition is now part of the colonized mindset that we have, that you're not Indian unless you're federally recognized. Yes. So. Which is super complicated. Um, 
So we have three federally recognized Cherokee tribes. We have Eastern Band in North Carolina. We have Cherokee Nation, which is where I'm enrolled. And we have the United Ketuba Band. Um, Cherokee Nation, uh, we don't have a blood quantum limit. It can be by ancestry. But what makes it complicated is you had to be living in one of the Cherokee counties between 1899 and 1906 before Oklahoma became a state. I know a lot of people who uh, are Cherokee by by blood and ancestry, but because they were living, let's say, next door in, in Leas County, you know, and in, in a, in a Muskogee Creek County uh, during those years, they were literally stricken from the rolls. You can go to the Dawes rolls and see their name. It has a strike through it, and it will say they were stricken from the rolls because they weren't living in a Cherokee County between 1899 and 1906. So even though that means they can't get their card, um, to me it shows at one time they were Cherokee Nation until we, we bought into these things. And of course my big rant, and I'm speaking as Delina Studi, not as a district director of Native Voices or Cherokee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always feel like to do that when I get on my soapbox. But, uh, but it's, I feel, because in order to be federally recognized in the states, you need citizenship and you need land base. Uh, and we have, a, and, you know, it's not uncommon for a lot of tribes to not, they, they allow dual citizenship in the fact that you can be a Cherokee Nation citizen and a citizen of the U.S., but they don't allow a lot of people to be a dual in, in the, like the example you gave, right? You know, so you could have technically full indigenous blood, but if you're not in the same, uh, you know, same sovereign tribal nation, you may not get to claim it. And so if you have a tribe that has blood quantum, eventually, you're going to breed out of that blood quantum unless you're going to keep marrying into your family, which is ew. Uh, <laughs> we saw what happened to the royal family. We don't want that. <laughs> Delaney's to be speaking high. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but also what happens is whenever you finally don't meet those citizenship requirements, guess who gets that land? Not us. It goes back to the federal government. So to me, it's a whole system that's set up upon our extinction and extermination because they want to finish what they started. And, you know, and once again, these are Delaney Studi's beliefs and not that of any other positions that I hold. Um, but I've just seen so many people hurt by this, you know, this colonized structure and that we never really bought into until recently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, 1924. Oh. 1924 was the Citizenship Act that's imposed, and we're celebrating, I'm celebrating, the 100 year anniversary of that today with a big, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, I mean, this is the complex nature and the, the complexity and the, the history. And you're seeing it being played out, you know, in the mush hole, how colonization, how detrimental, how education could be detrimental, how things that you would think that, like, you know, when the, the, the way that they pitched and told the story about how and why these kids had to go to these institutions to become productive citizens, become productive people that were gonna have opportunities for jobs and things like that. And, and it, it, it can be argued as well that people who went to some of these residential schools had varying experiences. It wasn't always the, 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 the traumatic experience. By and large it was. And that's the story that really needs to probably be told in a lot of ways. But there are those little moments and those little blips where somebody got to learn how to play piano, you know, or got to do different things, got to learn how to become an actor or, or do different things, or a musician or some sort of had artistic, you know, opportunities and things like that. Or football, you know, a guy like Jim, or, um, Jim Thorpe, you know. But again, this was not the natural way that these things were supposed to happen, and that's not how they were supposed to really play out. It was forcibly. You know, and there was a lot of really horrible things that happened along the way for this all to kind of come about. And it's now that to have two women playwrights is, is really remarkable and, and, you know, amazing to be a part of, to be able to sit here with you both, you know, that you both can now shape and shift the trajectory as to like how indigenous storytelling continues to go on and how that happens. And I just hope that, again, this young playwright thing does take off, you know, and that, you know, it's interesting that you kind of went in a different direction where Delana was like early on saying that like, there's nothing here for me in Oklahoma, I have to move off to be able to find my voice and be able to do the different things. And that's often the case, you know, that people have to leave because it can be a bucket of cracks back home, you know. But also, you spent a lot of majority of your time off and are now moving back 
to find solace, to find peace, and to also find, you know, new stories, but also to kind of revive, you know, revive new old stories to kind of bring those back. And I think that I, I love both of your, your your paths really, in that you're both doing good work. It seems like you work together, you know, and you found ways to to find each other. And there's more richness that comes to that because of the experiences that you both have, and they're from different sort of places. And also, you know, the Tuscarora were neighbors of probably Cherokee at one point, is what I hear. I think they believe us. <laughs> <laughs> Just going on record. <laughs> they believe the too, at least. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> we can be nice. <laughs> so. What are stories that you want to tell moving forward? What are things that you want to, you know, bring to the bring to light that maybe aren't so as dark as the boarding school stories and things like that? But what are some positive stories that can be the champion? The, the Indians finally win at the end. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, this is going to just showcase what a nerd I am. Um, I love science fiction. I love seeing Native people in the future because we have not, you know, they tried so hard to keep us in the past. So I, I love anything that has like this, you know, science fiction or also horror. I do believe that we have some of the scariest, you know, things out there that no one ever talks about and for good reason. But I, I love those kinds of stories. I love stories that are, uh, you know, that we don't normally get to hear about Native people. I also love comedies with Native people. Uh, you know, I finally got to see my uncle, and this is kind of weird. He got to do a, he's, sorry, Wes, he's in his 70s, and he finally got to do a love story. He didn't get to have a love scene until he was in his 70s. Because, you know, Indian men are stoic and they don't love people. Um, but he finally got to have it. It was very awkward watching him make out with some lady. But, uh, <laughs> glad you got to have that experience, you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm glad that they got to showcase a love story that's not like this typical, you know, pretty white lady meets a pretty blonde guy, and they have, you know, a complicated relationship with their ancestral history, but yet they overcome odds and class barriers. It's like, no, I'm, I'm done with that story. Uh, so, you know, so for me, anytime I get to see like a romantic comedy with Native people, I get to see us in the future. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen one yet. I want to see this, uh, and all because, and I hate rom coms. I hate them in that passion, but I would show up in full force for that one, right? You know, um, I want, I want that moment for our people. Um, I also, I mean, I would love to see Indians in space. I mean, yes. you know, like the sky people. You know, I mean, it's like you know, they're trying to like keeping the moon from being colonized because I think that's the next step. You know, but. I want to see those movies. I also like native superheroes because I feel like that's who we are. Uh, so I want to see more of that. So when you ask me like what I want to see, my, my, my inner 12-year-old dork that was you know playing video games by myself because I had no friends. Um, these are the stories I want I want to see. And I also think you know those are stories that we haven't seen yet. And I want you know I want us to keep imagining ourselves with a bigger, brighter future. And I don't want you know, the, the world at large to only think of us as a thing of the past or something that they can only see behind museum glass. Because we are here, we're beautiful, we're thriving, and I want to showcase that. Yes. All right, thank you, your turn. Uh, cosine, cosine, cosine. I love genre, and honestly, you can teach in genre format, absolutely. And I, I, I love science fiction, I love rom-coms, I am not ashamed, I'm ashamed. <laughs> we got some cute boys, I want to see some speeches, I want to see happy endings. Or, just stories, just stories. <laughs> Fun, exciting, you know, uh, moments where our knowledge is actually like motivates things and makes it solves the day, not something that people mine for mm -hmm. wisdom or use as a, you know, self-flagellating. We should have listened to the and it's like, yeah, you should have. 
Because they are really writing without barriers in their brains, and I love it. I, when I, you know, when I started writing, we all, you know, I carried that. Oh, I better be, you know, this is teaching it. It's like, yeah, but you're not. That's not your brain. But I see it with the kids. They just write what they want. They embrace it. They, and uh, indigenous video games are out there. Indigenous graphic, uh, and it's exciting because. Again, this whole idea, oh, like, I can, I've, I've had people say, don't you want them to write the literature? It's like, absolutely. But that is very much a Western mindset that that is the only valid way to tell stories. We live in a very three-dimensional, colorful, tangible world, and I think that storytelling evolves just like, again, like the world, like the people do. And whatever way it compels you, entertains you, pulls you in, and makes you listen. I'm in. I'm in. I'm, I'm a fan, you know? So that's me. Sorry. No. Um, okay. Here's your challenge, though. Oh. <laughs> You're up against TikTok. Oh. <laughs> and reels and things like that. Can we make 20 second, 30 second, you know, Three minute stories that can, you know, reach those audiences, reach those young people. We can try. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, there is, we can certainly give it a shot, and again, I probably think, I think that the younger people are probably have a better chance than me, who is, again, half Jamaican. Um, but, uh, yeah, we can totally try, uh, there's, again, you can tell a depth of the story with, with some well-chosen, a few well-chosen words. It doesn't have to have a hundred pages of context, mm -hmm. and sometimes just a moment. Just, I mean, if you look back at Sandy's piece, mm -hmm. and him sitting with the apple, and just that patting of the apple, that to me told so much story. And it may not reach everybody, but it'll reach some. And yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Delena, how do you uh, compete against TikTok? I don't. <laughs> don't have, I, I have Instagram and Facebook barely. Uh, you know, and I, you know, that's where I kind of rely on my nephews and people like Jasper. Uh, so I think, sorry, Jasper, you're the only young person I know in the audience. Uh, it also you inspire me greatly, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but you know, but it's I, you know, I, I trust that they will take us there. And, and I was also going to give the example of Santi's video today, right? You can you can do a lot with just images without saying a word. Uh, and you know, and I, once again, I, I'm always amazed at, at anything that's dance or visual artist because once again, engineering her, I'm very literal. So whenever I can see people, you know, string these images and movements and physicalities together to create something. It's, it just it sparks something inside me that I don't have, and it just inspires me even more. And so uh, I'm always intrigued by that, and I think that you know, we, there are, I'm sure that there are Native folks doing this already. I don't want to say that it hasn't been done, because I'm not on the TikTok. Uh, and I don't plan to be, I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm sure it's being done out there. I'm sure that there's, there's and there, of course, I also trust that there's another generation after this that's going to even blow our minds even further. You know, it's and it's all building on you know stepping stones that were laid before us, and so I, I have faith in that. I don't know if I have faith that I will do it, but I know that I, I have I have faith, I have trust that we will get it done. If we haven't done it already. Yeah. Well, I, I'm also a believer that you know what's new is old and what's old is new. Mm -hmm. You know, and that this 20 second fad of like TikTok is going to fade. We're going to it's going to go back to. People are going to spend time with giving one another, you know. And I think COVID was kind of one of those times where it was a great reset, you know, yeah. like they say. And I think that, you know, for me, is that's when I kind of came out and started to do the podcast and things like that. And I was amazed at the number of people who have responded to the thing and who wanted to like actually come in and actually sit and talk and actually spend time with one another. <clears throat> when there was this time where like we had to be distanced by six feet, you know. And I actually originally started to think about the podcast name being Six Feet of Conversation, 
you know what I mean, because you're so far away from each other. But I just thought that it was an important thing to, you know, just spend time with people and have What is the name of the podcast? Because uh, you haven't been saying podcast. Oh, I feel like we need to be a little specific in case people want to listen to this. Uh, I've been listening to it and it blows my mind every time I hear it. I learned something new, which is very exciting. So um, do you mind talking about that? Sure. sure. So it's the original people's podcast and it's on Spotify. <laughs> Thank you. I have, a, I have a cool medallion because of it. Um, it is not a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and thank you. Um, you know, the podcast has been an interesting project for me. Um, I don't prepare for it. I, I do a little bit of reading about the people that I'm going to speak to and hear, you know, because I want to respect the person that I'm talking to. And, and oftentimes I'm just sitting down with this person for the very first time. But, you know, it's sitting down with both of you. I was fortunate enough to meet you last year, but then, you know, maybe you today, Vicky, I mean, like, you're familiar for some reason, I, you know, that we both lived in New York for a time and we probably crossed paths and knew each other at some point. But, but you know, just to pay respect to the, to not my elders, but aunties, <laughs> okay, that, you know, there's, there's something that I want to, you know, pay my respect to you. Uh, but also, what can I learn from you, and what can I hear from you? And, and then when I got to read some of your work and see some of the things that you do, I was like, yeah, that's 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 one that that story needs to come out, you know. And we need to, you know. So for me to be able to do my homework and to be able to then get you to talk about it and to share it, you know, in a way, um, you know, I feel fortunate to be able to do that type of work, and it's and it's awesome to be able to have that. Um, and Delaney, you know, being able to get, see your show last year, you know, because. I don't know. I don't know if I would have otherwise gone to see it. You know what I mean? It was a, it was an opportunity and experience. And um, when I did and I saw it, it was transformative. It was something that I was just like, whoa! Like this is something that I've been missing. You know, I hadn't really been exposed to the theater in that way. To now see Santee's piece and to see what that is now evoked in me, you know, it's almost evoked sort of new militancy. <laughs> like, you know, I want to pull my kids up to school. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And do those things. I mean, I'm like, forget that system. You know, it's not meant for us. Um, and my wife, if she's tuned in, she's going to, you know, wrangle my neck later on. But, you know, you know call me a traitor or whatever. But, you know, but it's, it, it, but, you know, it, it's hard, you know, as indigenous people, because it's still not cool to be native, you know, because everything around us says no. But those who are, we know we're cool. We know we're great. We know that it's an amazing culture to be a part of. And the people that, are exposed to it are then you know wanting to be you know brought on, brought in closer. They want to know more about it. What is it? I mean, what's kept you guys here for as long as you've been sitting here listening to this? You know, I mean, a lot of respect goes out to you because you know there's been some flagellation and you guys have been kind of taking some beatings here and there and you've been called white people and things like that. You know, <laughs> as a pejorative, you know. <laughs> but you know, but it, again, it's it, it is our way to welcome people in, you know, it really is our way. And um, and no shame on you, um, Rachel, you know, for doing the, the land acknowledgement earlier, but I've been really pushing back against those things in a lot of ways because they come across as eulogies to Native people, you know? And they're not something that really comes across as like this honoring thing, especially when it's done by a white person. Because, let me give you the scenario. So here we are on the ancestral land of the ex nation of people who are no longer here and they're no longer around and I don't even know where they're at now. But I feel bad about the fact that I'm now in the middle of their shit and I'm keeping their shit and they're not going to get this shit back. And they're gone anyway, so who gives a shit? <laughs>
Can I open up the questions? Do we have time for that or should we? 15 minutes and then we're going to... Oh, okay. Are you okay? So we'll, we'll probably go five-ish. Questions, anybody? I just have a comment for Lana, Star Trek Voyager, character Chapter 5, you played a native person on the Star Trek. Oh, wow. Do you know that? Because I, okay, the sad thing is I am not a Star Trek person, but now I must have to do it. So you know this episode then? Uh, it's, 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 it's a character, yes. Robert Beltran played Chakotay. Yes. yes. We did oh, set and... Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, we did. Thank you. Set an Indian count for that one. Yeah. I want more though. I'm going to be thinking. So far it's like one. That's one. Well, my uncle got to play the blue guy in Avatar. I was going to just, okay. Uh, yeah. I was going to bring up Avatar when you well, said that. Well, that was my, my dad's joke, is whenever we saw the movie, he took my whole family to see it, and my, my nephews are really young, and my, my middle nephew, who is now 21, was, was like 10 when he saw it, and he was like, Delina, Alina, those were naked aliens. And I was like, oh. I was like, I think in that geo is called indigenous nudity. nudity. And then my dad called Wes immediately, and he's like, hey, I just wanted to check in on you. He's like, why? He's like, well, the last movie I saw, you were really skinny, you were a little blue, and you had a tail. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions out here? Sure. Another question. Um, it's about the Tick Packers. There actually are quite a few of them. See? Uh, and Chi Jim, he does like mini horror stories. What? Awesome. Hey, I'm Chi Jim. C-H-E-E-J-I-M. Mm -hmm. C-H-E-A-I-M. You just got calling You just got calling Delaney, you just got TikTok calling You're going to be on TikTok by the end of the video. I will have my nephews look it up. I will leave no digital footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Well, it's really funny because when we when we moved, I was born when I was born. I was it was Caledonia. The family was already settled there. Um, my dad was the first Jamaican there, but as you can tell, he's pretty pale passing. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, we did. We had neighbors asking him if he lived in tree houses and ate bananas for food. And the funniest thing in the world is my dad, who was a willful optimist and just, you know, one of those guys who would just suck it up, whereas my mother was like, I'm going to tear their throats up. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad was like, no, we had a house on the ground, and I, I made some jerk chicken for you. You'll like it. And he, after a while, like, when he passed, he was still living there and visiting the rest with my sister, you know, my sister's home on the rest. But he, all these people were helping to care for him. However, when I was about 17, before I left town, a new black family moved in. And we were excited. It's like, oh, so we're not going to be the only folks who are officially brown in town. A petition was started. Oh. So it's one of those moments where I'm like, what? And they came to our door, too. The Jamaican Tuscarora family, they came to our door with the petition. And we're like, are you out of your mind? So it's one of those things where you can live somewhere and things calm down or you somehow get accepted or you're the pet, you're the token. Um, I don't know what your experience was of Caledonia, but um, it's better now. You know, I've met a couple more folks who've moved there, and they're saying, oh, no, I, I'm okay here. I find it quite friendly. And, and, and there is now two more Jamaican indigenous families on six. <laughs> so that's, that's nice to know. But generally, when I, when I was growing up, it was the land of petitions and things like that. Question, sure. Yes, so this question that go for the previous panel and also, or even this one, but where, um, how, did, uh, how did the children get their numbers? How were the numbers chosen for the children at residential schools? So for the people who are um, streaming in, the question was, and this goes back to the other um, 
uh, previous panel, but it refers to Sam Key's story as well and, and, and here. Uh, the question is how were students assigned numbers um, and, and why were students identified through numbers? And Doug, the only way that he had kind of put it and the way that he had kind of explained it was, you know, much like when you become an inmate, you know, in jail, you're assigned a number for one thing. But then as you're, you know, there at the, at the mush hole for a, a period of time, they strip away your humanity and they strip away the name and the identity of that person and it just becomes a number. So it's this dehumanizing process of like really kind of taking away any kind of, you know, identity to the past person or the person or the community or the family that they were once a part of. And so, you know, the number, you know, becomes sort of this, this new identity and it's really a, a callous identity, I guess, in a way, and a faceless identity in that way as well. So I think that's, that's how it was. So, uh, Pete, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, thank you for a wonderful panel. It's great to see you all of you here with your team. I just wanted to approach the, um, the technology, the phones, the technology, all this stuff will continue to evolve. And what's current, what's modern now, in two years, will be obsolete. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem with that, that I see, is a lot of that is driven by profit. Mm -hmm. Developing technologies that will never go away, plastics and all these things like that. So, a lot of these things will go away, but the population goes up. Because I'm sure you just go, go east coast is not all back out because the electricity went out. So, one thing that will outlast everything is our Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And so, how is it? It's very exciting to support young people and others too, because it's not going to go away to our humanity. Is young people find out who you are, what you're good at, what you might hear, what your purpose is like, and a lot of that you can come from indigenous cultures mm -hmm. that are ancient. So how do we keep that those cultures alive, thriving, with whatever technology you have today, what's going to be tomorrow and going forward? I mean, that's a tricky situation. I think it's uh, there's a lot of language that has been lost. There's a lot of stories that has been lost. I know my grandfather for a long time was the only Tuscarora speaker on six, um, but they did record him, and uh, it he helped. He was one of the voices that helped with a lot of folks from Lewiston in creating the Tuscarora English Dictionary, and it's it's really sad to me because it, in my family, like you know, he was fluent in all six. And by the time it got down to my mom, she spoke about 26 words, like um, an amalgam of Tuscarora Mohawk, like the most common languages used. But you know, like my uncles spoke like Mohawk, Seneca, uh, Cayuga, and Tuscarora, and then and my aunt Mike did, and then as it got down to my uncle Sam and uh, my uncle Harold, and 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 they they ended up speaking like two, you know, two languages if, if they were lucky and by the time it got to mom, you know, so you can see what was going on at the time. And then my brother's generation, that's when the immersion school started. But in the interim, Tuscarora got lost in, in the mix. Um, so his recordings are out there. And um, there's a, another gentleman, I think, uh, is it Henry Hill? whose recordings are out there as well. And it helps for those of us who are trying to reclaim Tuscarora, so there's some ways to do that. And I do think there is value mm -hmm. in somehow getting recorded the voices of the elders because people have been pulled apart and you know they're pushing us to leave the reservations and go out into the city. And it's, the problem is, like part of me goes, yeah, we should, you know, when I was younger, it's like, well, it's all Indian territory. We should go claim it back. But at the same time, you forget that you have to assimilate to go into the city. You have to leave things behind to go there. Um, so it's that little catch-22 that happens. And um, so I, I feel like recordings will help it for it somewhat. But at the same time, like you said, electricity is, is, is one of those things that is ephemeral. Who knows how long that's going to be around. Um, and we can write it down too, but again, the books, they disappear and we have our stories, telling our stories. But at the same time, again, 
different voices get in the mix and we have the storytellers, the teacher, teacher folks who are not allowed to switch a word which is very different. I always try to explain, I'm like, I try to teach as well, but I'm not a storyteller. I'm not, I don't consider myself a culture bearer. I consider myself a member of the culture and somebody who writes for our people for entertainment and connection and unity, but I'm not a culture bearer. And I feel those folks, that practice must be protected because that is one of the few White things that, unless you completely succeed in wiping us out, is a way to maintain those 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 lessons, those voices. But that's that's I think the top two. But go. <laughs> I was told to go, so I shall go. <laughs> um, Cherokee Nation has really been embracing the technology. Um, one of my favorite things is on our iPhones. I don't know if this is true for Android people, but on the iPhone we actually have our syllabary. So I can type to my dad in our language using our, you know, our syllabary. Um, or I could type, I, you know, he doesn't respond back now. But um, he does in different ways. But, uh, and it also do it phonetically as well. So if I want to say, like, thank you, I say wado, and I can type in w-a-d-o, and it will transfer it to the syllabary for me. Uh, we also have online courses, uh, so you can learn language online. It can be recorded, or you can actually uh, do immersion with an elder. Uh, Cherokee Nation is also putting a lot of money into our master's language program where they actually take um, uh, Cherokee citizens that are, you know, uh, sometimes my age, you know, which I'm old, uh, and they pair them up with an elder and you learn the language, you know, uh, and, and they train them to be teachers. Uh, we also have the Cherokee Nation Film Commission. Uh, my favorite thing about our people is we actually have a language department. Uh, which works with both the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, who also have a language department, and the United Gatua Band. And I jokingly call it the Tri Wizards Council, but it's really the Tri Language Council. Uh, and they, they create new words all the time. Like, we have a word for iPhone. I can't pronounce it, but we have one. And, um, and honestly, they, they create words all the time, and then they meet as a council, a uh, representative from each of the three nations, and they debate that word. And until they reach consensus, we don't use that word. And every year they release a new dictionary of all the new words that are created. So, yeah, so I'm very excited about that. I'm like, it's like, thank you, Sherry Nation. Uh, is it on Google Translate? I don't know if it's on Google Translate. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if we're that free with it. I know if you go to the uh, CherokeeNation.org, our website, you can find a word list, and it has some of the words there. Once again, it's, you know, uh, oh, we, have, we also have a lot of books that are in the language as well, uh, including hymnals and, and Bibles, which I find interesting. Uh, but what's interesting about our Bibles is if you can read the language, you'll also realize it's not just the Bible, but also, uh, you know, other stories are mixed in, uh, which makes me very happy. Yeah. Sure. And just to follow up on that, do they also have folks that help other nations to start that process or help, like, to create, like, a blueprint, like, on how to do this, or... That I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, because I don't work for the language department, so I don't wanna give you false information, but I wouldn't be surprised if they don't share resources. And if they don't, then they, they should. So, one thing that I wanna, I, I do wanna touch on over here, we are talking about language in particular, and you know, language is a beautiful part of the culture, and that was one that was taken away early on, right away and punishable, you know, terribly. But I can't help but think about, you know, your storytelling had it been done in a language, you know, because there's a richness, there's a thing that happens when it's lost in translation that doesn't come out, that doesn't really kind of, you know, really fully capture the story unless it's done in the language, you know. And, you know, you just said that, you know, your language has a word for the iPhone. And probably the closest thing to it is is that it's something that you talk into that, you know, there's probably some sort of literal translation as to, you know, what it is. And for us, you know, for example, the word strawberry in the Seneca language is saves up on Jason Dasat, you know. It's a small little thing, right? It's a wild strawberry about this big. But what a wild strawberry really means is the burning embers inside of a fire is what it represents, you know. And that's what it looked like, and that's how they described it, and that's how they saw it in, in the earth and in, in, in you know, the world and things like that. And so imagine that's again why 
so much work is being done to understand and to reclaim the language, why you know different nations have language departments and things like that, because that informs also our relationship to the relatives and the people in the world around us and the earth and things like that. That's why it's important that we do these things and why curriculum work is important and why education through an indigenous lens and an indigenous you know, informed you know, uh, form of language and, and, and teaching and things like that is an important thing. So again, that was my plug earlier for curriculum work and things like that and the work that's happening out here. But um, you know, I hope that eventually that's that part of it and that maybe that's the next um, step for the young playwrights and things like that is to be able to tell stories that both come from the, the language but then also can can work both ways, you know, and, and carry on and creating new stories, you know, because I think there's new stories that need to be told, and um, we're not a fixed culture, we're not a fixed people, and, um, you know, and it's gonna be led by women. That's another major thing, so, yeah, well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks, thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you, Delana, and Delana will be back. We're gonna take a 10 minute break in case you need some more coffee. <laughs> and then Delana will be back with Jasper talking about, we're gonna see Jasper's work, we're gonna see Arenda's work, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Arenda's work, and then we're gonna hear more about young playwrights, and um, young lady playwrights, the festival, is it Embers? Embers. Embers, and I love that name, it means so much. And um, yes, so let's take a break.